Thank you for joining us. Today we'd like to have a panel discussion uh, titled Exploiting the Internet and Becoming a Shining Star. And I'm really pleased to have uh, three associates with me, very esteemed associates, and I'd like each to um, introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Guy. I'm Dr. Sloan Guy from Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. I'm uh, Jessica Luke. I'm a second year cardiovascular surgery resident from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. I'm Mari Antonoff. I'm a thoracic surgeon at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. And I'm Ed Bender, cardiac surgeon at Stanford University. And today we're going to talk about how the internet plays a role in establishing and growing our own careers. Um, and we'll just have a, a discussion uh, centered around a few questions. So, uh, Dr. Guy, can you tell me how do you represent yourself and or your institution using uh, social media and the internet? Yes, I found it uh, very powerful um, on several fronts. Uh, for me, the most important one is reaching out to patients. I do a lot of minimally invasive and robotic surgery, and um, oftentimes patients are referred uh, to their local doctor who refers them to the local surgeon who may not have those uh, types of procedures available to them. Um, so my goal, one of my goals with the internet was to make sure that patients were aware that what I do was available to them. Uh, now, that can be controversial. You're sort of bypassing the traditional uh, referral lines by doing so, but the reality is we live right in the middle of the information era. It's the information age. And so for me, actually the first um, inkling I got that it would be useful for doing that, for reaching the patients directly, was Barack Obama's presidential campaign. He was very successful at, um, at getting multiple small donations uh, from voters bypassing the traditional political establishment. And so I thought, well, maybe I could do the same thing by reaching patients and letting them know what, what we could provide for them. So you're basically building a new road between yourself and the patients. That's exactly correct. Um, it's, it's, um, again, there's different viewpoints about whether that's a good thing or bad thing, but my underlying hypothesis was that many patients were not informed of a, a particular clinical option being available to them, sure. and I wanted to change that in a credible and ethical way. So Dr. Luke, you're, you're a trainee uh, but I'm, st I'm sure that you have some ideas about uh, effective ways and more effective ways to communicate with patients or colleagues. How do you use social media uh, to, uh, to establish that kind of line of communication? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that question, Dr. Bender. Um, so in terms of how, we, how I communicate with patients and colleagues and uh, mentors and other specialists in the field, uh, it varies by platform. So, uh, for example, I use uh, Twitter more for professional networking um, and uh, keeping in touch with uh, mentors and um, colleagues in the specialty to advocate for uh, research and disseminate findings from conferences and publications on Twitter um, and to learn about the developments of the field. In terms of other platforms I use, I use Facebook as well, and uh, I use that mostly actually for uh, keeping in touch with friends and family and, uh, and uh, keeping in touch with classmates, and they have these groups where you could uh, collaborate on different projects and have closed discussions. Uh, and then in terms of Instagram, it only lets you post pictures with a little piece of text. So I, I don't really use yeah, that um, really personally don't. myself, but I know lots of people who like to post about their lives and share it, share it like a day in the life of um, me. And sometimes patients, um, I know my colleagues, sometimes patients like that and mm -hmm. they get a glimpse into the life of a resident and it's a way to also inspire others like medical students or uh, trainees into the field. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Antonoff, you're at one of the finest uh, cancer institutions in the world. Uh, does MD Anderson uh, play a role in 
your participation in social media, does MD Anderson uh, encourage or are they somewhat neutral to your activities? Um, that's a great question, thank you so much. I will say that being at such a large institution, there certainly is an entire office of folks that are devoted to the institution's social media presence and also provide help for the faculty and help them get, um, get onto social media and build a presence. For me, it wasn't my institution that led me to be on social media. I kind of did it on my own, and, um, but I collaborate with those folks a lot. You know, we've talked a lot about trying to reach patients, and I do want to make a really important point, which is that there are ample data to show that the majority of patients in the United States right now are looking online. They are doing Google searches. They are looking to find out information before they choose where they want to go for their care. And so we all have digital footprints that are readily available online, and we all need to recognize that if we aren't molding that persona and defining our brand and deciding how we want to be seen, the patients are going to find something pretty random. And I can tell you, before I became heavily engaged in social media, some of the first searches that came up when you looked for my name were completely irrelevant. They had to do with places where I did moonlighting as a general surgery resident, and it would be like a vitals.com score saying I was a really good family practice moonlighter or whatever it might be, which is not what I need my patients to see at this stage of the game. And of course, my institution um, has, a, has a, a website for me that can be found in the search engine, and I've got a CTS net page and everything else, but I do try very hard to shape the way that I'm seen by the public. And so when I use social media, such as Twitter, I'm not specifically reaching out to the patients. I'm not trying to talk to them specifically, but I'm trying to define my brand so that when patients know they've got an appointment with me or they're looking for someone in the Houston area and they look me up, what they find is a very clear definition of how I describe myself in terms of my practice and my niche. So you're describing a one-way street, basically, when it comes to interaction with patients where your profile, your abilities, your experience are all available to them on the internet in various ways, shapes, and forms. Do you ever uh, go the other way on that street? Do you ever uh, contact them or interact with patients on a social media platform? That's a great question. I do not, and I think a lot of institutions actually have policies against that exact behavior. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be very careful. Uh, many places, um, obviously we all have different practice types, and some people are hospital employed or university employed or private practice. But uh, those of us who are employees, most of us have to adhere to policies related to how we communicate with patients. And frankly, I think we just need to be clear. Everyone should understand that anything you do on social media is permanently, it's a permanent record. So if it's right. not something that you would put on your letterhead from your office, it probably shouldn't be shared with patients. People seeking medical advice, usually my response to them is, we'd be happy to see you at MD Anderson. Here's the, uh, the office to get in and we, you know, we can evaluate you. I don't think we should provide diagnoses or medical advice over social media. Oh, that's a great answer, thank you. Uh, Dr. Luke, do you use the internet to uh, learn about uh, various parts of your training, uh, to learn about procedural issues, to learn about new techniques? I mean, we can all expose ourselves uh, to the public uh, on social media, but we are also consumers. Do you, do you engage social media to expand your knowledge base? Absolutely. Thank you for that question, Dr. Bender. Um, so I use CTSNet as a resident quite heavily, and I look up procedures uh, online, and I watch them over and over and over, and I find that that really helps in shortening my uh, learning curve, because after seeing it over and over, I could zoom in, I could pause it, I could backtrack, and they often have people auditory, auditory uh, commentary uh, commenting on exactly what they're doing, which doesn't happen all the time in the operating room setting when you have a patient on the table, uh, especially in critical situations. But in a video setting online, they can do that and they can walk you through the procedure. Um, so I use that a lot. And then in terms of learning about uh, different procedures, there's lots of publications such as in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, um, talking about how to do it articles and those are incredibly helpful. And uh, Dr. Guy also posts a lot of uh, operative videos online um, of his procedures, and I find that incredibly helpful to see how he does his operations um, and unique intricacies of every surgeon, and I'm able to be able to consume that as a resident in Vancouver to see how internationally, how different surgeons are doing all those diff different surgeries that I would otherwise not have known about or been able to see. I understand, that's so it's great. truly a privileged opportunity to be able to have uh, blocks 
in their room to see what they're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, Dr. Guy, you're an experienced surgeon. You've produced a lot of uh, great content uh, in both uh, your websites and in videos. Uh, how about you? Do you consult the uh, internet or social media to learn or to refresh yourself on these sorts of um, I, I, I do, actually, and I think most surgeons um, do that. They may be hesitant to admit it, but, um, but they absolutely do. Um, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis that point, I would comment on one thing that Jessica uh, was speaking on. She's uh, looking at it from the standpoint of a resident, uh, learning things. I will tell you that I've, I've had a unique experience over the past few years with Twitter, where I'm following a lot of residents as they go through medical school, internship, and residency. And uh, of course, this generation is much more open about their experiences. And I'm actually learning about uh, what their experience it is, is from their perspective, which I've found to be you know, quite educational. The other uh, way that I've used, say, Twitter is, I, I, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I more often than not will hear about a landmark um, a paper that's outside the normal journals that I look at yeah. through social media than through you know the traditional routes, and you know things sort of go viral, and um, and that also acts I think as a filter because you know we none of us have time to go through 20 journals, you know we're very busy clinicians, um, but I do check my Twitter and if uh, if Jessica posts something on Twitter or Mara that is uh, that's a landmark uh, thing, I will then go to that article and read it. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I, I fully admit that uh, if I'm facing a case that I haven't done in a while or it's a particularly difficult case, I will be looking at videos probably for a couple hours before the case to uh, just to refresh myself of potential pitfalls or some pearls of wisdom. And I think that... Uh, it's very helpful, and I, I think we've got, as cardiac and thoracic surgeons, we've got great content to look at, and uh, the more the better, and I certainly do appreciate all the uh, information that uh, my fellow panelists have put out there on the internet. I would also like to add, Dr. Bender, that social media has an incredible role, even as a trainee, in terms of networking, uh, mentorship, and sponsorship. And we'll have had previous studies, Joe, and cardiothoracic surgery specifically, that uh, given uh, there has a very unique role for, for example, women in cardiothoracic surgery um, because of the limited number and uh, the lack of same-sex mentors at an institution, social media has a huge role for inspiring future women in cardiothoracic surgery and showing them uh, and giving them role models uh, through social media. Um, the other role that social media has had in my life has been uh, the campaigns, such as he for she campaigns, um, as well as uh, I look like a surgeon, um, as well as the New Yorker cover challenge. Those have dramatically changed my life. And it is uh, it has also, I think, also engages patients uh, and raises awareness of them for them about women in cardiothoracic surgery, and they would see me as well, and they would, they would call me doctor um, after, okay. after that campaign. And it is a very real, real difference that we see in social media and the power of uniting mo many people internationally in movements like this and to be able to raise awareness for matters that uh, matter to us. If, let me just continue with that thought. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, I believe that uh, Dr. Luke and Dr. Antonoff had kind of a mentor-mentee relationship, uh, either at some point or ongoing. Um, and I'm just wondering if you might expound on, uh, number one, did uh, social media play a role in establishing that? Does it play a role in continuing it, uh, it the relationship? And does it continue to um, evolve through uh, the use of social media? So um, Dr. Luke was a recipient of the Women in Thoracic Surgery uh, Scholarship Award a couple of years ago, and we were actually formally paired as mentor-mentee. However, it certainly has allowed us to continue to communicate and to share ideas and to um, 
to be part of the same conversation, even if it's asynchronous and in different geographic places. I think that's a really important point. Dr. Lucas pointed out so many of the ways that we can connect with one another in terms of networking and building rapport. I think it also eliminates the um, sometimes the multiple levels of formality between trainees and uh, practicing surgeons. Dr. Luke and I were paired through the Women in Thoracic Surgery, but I've also been approached through social media by a number of trainees who you know, get connected because they follow me and, and then they ask me about a paper or they ask me how they can get involved in the society or have questions about training or questions about being a mother and being a thoracic surgeon. So it does get rid of some of those traditional boundaries that prevent trainees, I think, from having faculty members who are accessible to them. The other part that I would add is it also connects us with individuals of the same specialty or other specialties to talk about even decision making regarding operations. So you all have discussed videos that guide your operative um, planning, but I find in my practice um, it's actually really helpful to talk about strategies. When do you operate on the patient? When is it better to have them get chemotherapy up front? Which patients are you just foregoing you know, a feeding tube after esophagectomy? Yeah. There are a lot of care management dis discussions that we can have, either related to the literature or related to people's practices, um, even just questions putting out on social media, how often do you make, or how long do you wait, make patients wait after removal of the chest before they can get on a commercial flight? Mm -hmm. These have all been like fantastic conversations that we've had, and you can engage so many surgeons in one setting and people of other, other um, specialties to talk about disease states or operations or a wide variety of global health issues. So it really does bring us together in so many ways that we wouldn't traditionally have the opportunity to do so. Thank you, Dr. Luke. Do you, um, uh, do, do you see yourself uh, playing uh, Dr. Antonoff's role in, in some respect now that you've established this relationship, you've got social media to uh, have an engaging and continuing communication, some perhaps of your, of, of, uh, your uh, former medical students that you were with or current medical students that look up to you and see uh, the important role you're playing in our society, do they um, uh, sort of contact you through social media and take advantage of that? Absolutely. It's uh, amazing how much social media has connected me to not only mentors and sponsors and um, networking opportunities with you all, but also to trainees as well. And it is uh, incredible to get messages from um, women uh, trainees or men trainees who ask you questions about how, how your path was like and how do you get from one stage to another. And they might not even be in your center. They would be remote. They would be international. And those are people who we would not have had the opportunity to ever connect with. And now they're able to have direct conversations with us. And the other beauty of Twitter and uh, social media is the asynchronous and synchronous uh, opportunities for um, communication. So it truly bridges time zones, um, geographic boundaries to allow uh, conversations uh, to evolve. Well, that's great. Um, Dr. Guy, do you sense that uh, your life or your practice would be different without uh, the advantages of social media and the internet? I don't think there's any question that that is, that is true. Um, at different points in my career in the last 10 years, there have been times where the majority of my referrals from patients were coming through either uh, social media or my websites, which are essentially blogs, a uh, form of social media. And, um, but I also think that it's enhanced my life in terms of the education that I've gotten uh, by learning the perspective of others, uh, without a doubt. Do you think that it's going to play an even more role? And, and can you predict the future how social media will become an imperative. Most of our uh, society members are um, really not all that computer savvy, uh, but they still either become a player or a victim of com the computer and internet and social media and the opinions that arise from wherever in the world. Um, can you predict if uh, that is even gonna be uh, more of an issue or do you think that uh, this is a, uh, we've kind of peaked and uh, I guess it's a leading question, so why don't you just go ahead and answer that? Um, I don't think we've even begun to peak in terms of the significance of uh, physicians' online presence in various forms, social media to be included. 
and you know I run across a lot of colleagues uh, like you do I'm sure all of you uh, that basically say well I don't really have a Twitter account or uh, you know I don't mess around with that well my advice to all the members is that the first step is to go Google yourself go Google your name and see what patients are seen or colleagues are seen and then you know start to take some responsibility you know and there are many of us um, who are available to our peers to help advise them about simple things uh, that they can do so I'll give you an example um, you know uh, health grades is an example of a rating system and one time I got a one star and I was very upset about that I, you know I'm a pretty good doctor <laughs> patients like me you know Boy, this is terrible, and I'd had thousands of patients who thought I was great. You know, obviously someone was not not happy. Uh, but what it really um, what really impressed upon me is, well, that comes up on the first page, and it looks horrible, and it doesn't really reflect the truth. So then I started thinking, well, how can I be proactive? So I would start to uh, solicit reviews from all my patients so that it would be uh, more accurate, and and that was. That was very successful. But up until that point, I really didn't go and look at my online presence. And I think a lot of physicians don't Google their names. And they really, uh, they really uh, need to do that. Now, I don't think everyone needs to carry to the extreme. Within this group of four, four I'm probably the least sophisticated, honestly. Uh, but, uh, but compared to most of my peers, I'm pretty, uh, pretty sophisticated. I do my own websites, et cetera. Uh, I don't think everyone has to be a programmer in order to become a successful physician. But it definitely needs to be part of the skill set to some degree. And of course, there's classes that are taught about how to do it, um, also how to stay out of trouble. I think a lot of our peers are hesitant to get into it because, you know, they've heard uh, they've heard stories. It, what they have to understand is that the Internet is just another means of communication, no differently than us talking to each other. And the same social rules apply there. Uh, but sometimes the consequences can be bigger, so you do have to be careful about what you say. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to speak up um, about issues that uh, that we're concerned about. And you know, freedom of information is a cornerstone of democracy, and I think it's going to be a huge part of advancing surgery over the next 20 to 50 years. Yeah, I think you hit on one really great point that what is on the internet is permanent. You've got mm -hmm. to be on your best behavior. You can't be glib, snide, and you've got to be honest and uh, empathetic uh, in your dealings uh, with something that's going to be present from now until eternity. Any comments? You look like you're ready. I, I do, yeah. I think I'm um, adding on to Dr. Guy's uh, comment. I think it's also very, it's our ethical responsibility as surgeons to know what information is out there about us and to correct the misinformation that is being propagated. <clears throat> Ethically, that is our professional responsibility. And I would add on to that. Um, you know, you made some great comments, Dr. Bender, about making sure that we behave in a professional manner when we're interacting in, in, online and in social media. And one issue that we may encounter is misinformation that's out there. And mm -hmm. you really have to take a step back and think about how you want to deal with it. If there's a specific patient complaint or something that someone's angry or upset, um, one of the very first things I do is I look at how many followers they have. Mm -hmm. And if they have like seven followers, it's not even worth the reply. If it's someone who has a very large presence and it's really related to care at my institution, then I think you can get risk management people involved uh, without necessarily doing it yourself or ask the social media folks at your institution. But there are some things that are important to clarify because I have seen data misquoted. Um, I've seen uh, tweets where people take a figure from an article that was about a different malignancy that showed uh, the benefit of radiation over surgery and it mm. actually wasn't lung cancer and it was being described as though it was for lung cancer. And in those situations, it's not worth it to have a fight, but professionally just ask, you know, could you please clarify the, the article to which that, you know, that came from? I'm not familiar with it, um, things like that. So there's some fights that are worth fighting if there's misinformation out there for patients, but comments like, you shouldn't be a surgeon, you're a woman, from someone who has three followers, it's, it's probably not worth your time, your effort, or your stress. So it's, it's, again, just kind of thinking about what the downstream consequences are of those, those choices you make. Yeah, I remember that interchange, and I think your responses were um, as appropriate as uh, they should have been. Uh, you could sense that uh, you were trying to get rid of misinformation 
yet not insult the person who is desperately seeking, seeking the information. And that's a very savvy and sophisticated way of, of dealing with this sort of situation, something that is not innate, something that you have to learn, and something that people like you need to teach. <laughs> so it's, that's really great. Um, any other uh, comments about uh, the importance of that uh, the internet and social media is gonna play in the future? I kind of think that um, we might start to develop social media in uh, various different formats where there may be private channels of social media so that now that our connectivity speeds are increasing, we might be able to do live surgery with ongoing social media as uh, an instructor um, and perhaps have uh, sort of a, a more direct uh, two-way street, uh, real-time situation with social media. I also think that social media is going to be playing an important role in terms of academic productivity. Um, I think that uh, Dr. Luke and uh, the TSSMN's uh, publications about the importance of tweeting to journal citations is important. I also think that uh, we need to establish a kind of an ongoing post-production peer review situation where articles uh, are continuously peer reviewed, not before publication, but also after publication. And it happened more frequently than say a letter to the editor and a response. I think uh, the possibilities for social media and the internet playing a role in expanding academic productivity and the transfer of knowledge, uh, as Dr. Guy said, uh, as we haven't even scraped the surface yet. Completely agree. I think um, my take home message is build your brand. This is your free reign to shape how you are perceived. Um, be ethical, correct misinformation, educate, mentor, sponsor, and inspire others. That's great. I don't think uh, I can improve upon that. What do you say? I think that, uh, yeah, no, I definitely agree. And you put it you know, very well. I think that um, uh, all surgeons need to uh, take on uh, this, uh, this work to some degree and own their online presence. I think I would take it a step beyond that. I think we have a responsibility as physicians to do this because our patients need information. We need to make sure that information is accurate and, and we, need to, we need to own that. Now different, you know, different people have different levels of involvement, um, but everyone needs to have some level of involvement. Yeah, I agree completely. I think the worst thing you can do is to ignore it um, because it'll overtake you. And uh, as you stated earlier, you have the ability and you almost have the personal responsibility to control your own presence and profile on social media. And those that uh, uh, don't do that will be defined by others. And uh, like right. you stated, it's important that we are able to define ourselves and put our best foot forward. And I think social media is a great equalizer throughout the world. Uh, so someone in uh, the East Coast of the United States or in Houston or in Canada or in the Middle East or Asia can have the same footing when it comes to establishing their brand, as you stated, and putting their best foot forward and making sure that uh, their message is an accurate message and a responsible one. Uh, because there's obviously room for um, malfeasance, if you will, and we'd all like to avoid that. And we'd all like to have this be a, a positive influence on, on the world and making sure our patients get the best outcomes they possibly can. And there's controversy that shouldn't be uh, avoided, but um, uh, Dr. Antonoff handled it completely correctly, better than uh, I certainly could have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took note and, and learned from that. So it's a continuous educational process. Well, I think we're close to the end of our time period. Um, I really want to thank our panelists. I thought the discussion on the use of social media and exploiting social media for good um, to expand and enhance your practice and your reputation 
uh, was really instructive for me and I hope uh, the viewers uh, of this video have the same sort of um, um, take home messages that uh, I do and that I think that uh, we are all thankful that we've got experts like uh, the people on my left uh, that are representing us on social media.